Oh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Okay, so appendicitis is bread and butter stuff. You guys should know this, right? Two things, remember it's attached to the cecum, okay? And do we know what vermiform means? We know what vermiform means, right? You know what it means? No? Worm-like. It looks worm-like. When you see an appendix, a human appendix, I don't think cats have an obvious appendix if they even have one. But when you see it on a human, it looks like a little worm sticking off there. And it's a grouping of lymphatic tissue, so there's going to be white blood cells in it. Okay, it's part of that um, you know, immune system response that we'll see in the GI tract. Excuse me. And it just it's just sort of hanging off the cecum, okay? And really we could live without it. It's just kind of a like a vestigial structure that's just sort of hung on for a while, okay? And what can happen is you can obstruct that lumen of the opening. If you can imagine that little finger-like projection, there's a little opening where it opens and it lets some of those white blood cells into the cecum to contribute towards that immune response. And it can get blocked with poop. Okay, and the fancy word for that poop blockage is fecalith. <laughs> okay, or well, we don't want to call it poop blockage. A poop plug, if you will. We call it a fecalith. And it'll <clears throat> would start to um, have a buildup of substances back into the appendix. It'll stagnate. It can um, start to fester with bacteria. And it can start to enlarge. And if it gets large enough, obviously, it can rupture. Okay. And we know the pain pattern, right? Obscure periumbilical pain to light, right lower quadrant pain. The thing that I did learn from preparing this that I found kind of interesting is um, the nerves, okay, do we understand the difference between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum? Sort of kind of. The visceral peritoneum is going to be the layer on the organ itself. So if I were to open up my abdominal cavity and put my finger on my appendix, it's covered with visceral peritoneum. And it's a serous membrane, okay? And then parietal peritoneum is going to be the serous membrane on the wall. So if I open up my abdominal cavity, I peel back all those abdominal, you know, my strong abdominal muscles, ha, 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 after two kids, and I put my finger on the wall that's parietal. The parietal has more nerves. That's why as the appendix gets more inflamed, as my diverticulatus got more inflamed, it started to push on the abdominal wall. And instead of this diffuse abdominal pain at the beginning stages when it's not gotten big enough to touch the wall, people are kind of like, it just kind of hurts. Well, not kind of, it hurts a lot. To, no, it hurts right here. It hurts right here. And it's because there's more nerves that are more sensitive in that parietal peritoneum. I thought that was pretty cool. And that's why it goes from that diff diffuse radicular, uh, I shouldn't say it's radicular, it's diffuse, they're two different things, to a specific, more of a localized pain. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. Now, obviously, it can go to peritonitis, and we know that with peritonitis, it's going to be inflammation of peritoneal cavity. More specifically, is when we break those serous membranes, and we wet, let inflammation and we let substances from one area of the body to the other area of the body. We like to keep things compartmentalized. We have bacteria, all different types of bacteria throughout the body. We got to keep them where they're meant to be, right? Okay, you know, for example, urine is sterile, we know that. Okay, the vagina has about 200 strains of bacteria. The rectum has about four to 500 strains, okay? So we have different bacterias that are important in different areas and have specific functions. We gotta keep them where they're supposed to be though. That's the thing. If you open that lumen of the appendix, which connects to, you know, the cecum, you're gonna let those bacteria into the abdominal cavity where they are not supposed to be, okay? So that's the problem, and that's why we have all these subdivisions, is to keep people where they should be, okay, our microscopic people. So peritonitis, obviously, if the appendix ruptures, and we're getting bacteria into areas that they shouldn't be. And on top of bacteria in the GI tract that shouldn't be out of it, we also start to get anaerobic bacteria. When we get the appendix blocked, and we're not letting substances flow in and out of it, we could start to get anaerobic bacteria that build up in that appendix and it would open up into the peritoneal cavity. Kind of nasty stuff, right? And that can happen along the GI tract. It could have happened when I had diverticulitis, right? If that had progressed and um, opened, it could have caused a peritonitis as well. 
<clears throat> other other things will go over can cause peritonitis. Oh, and I guess we'll remember. So visceral versus parietal peritoneum. Okay, visceral is going to be the serous membrane. So peritoneum is going to be the membrane on the wall or on the organ itself. Okay, visceral is going to be on the organ. Parietal is going to be on the abdominal wall. I just totally lectured about all this. Everyone stay in their places. This is about the bacteria and where they should be. That's everything that I just lectured about. Okay. So, but we can also get external infections, obviously, you know, wounds, but a big one's going to be STDs. You know, if we get STDs that come up, you know, work their way into that peritoneal, they could come up through the uterus, through the fallopian tubes, they could go right into the abdominal cavity, okay, and they could cause um, peritonitis in there. And what happens with that that's kind of nasty is if it continues, if it's somebody who is not... Um, prone to taking care of themselves and that peritonitis continues of course where we have inflammation we will have fibrosis we will have scarring and they can get all sorts of scarring into the peritoneal cavity all the way up to the liver okay so kind of nasty stuff acute abdomen okay that's pretty self-explanatory uh, sudden syndrome acute pain fever vomiting um, from an acute in inflammation. Diffuse pain, which will become more specific, and that's that triggering of that parietal peritoneum, okay? It likes to form in the peritoneal cavity, you know, remember in different areas, just like when we're working in the brain. The brain, <clears throat> pardon me, likes to turn into a liquefractive necrosis because there's not that connective tissue in there. It's just neurons. In the abdomen, it likes to turn into a fibrinous exudate, which is gonna deposit those fibers and cause that fibrous scar tissue, okay? And then a fistula, we all know what that is, right? Connection between adjacent organs, never a good thing. <clears throat> ah, yes, diverticulitis, I know this well. So the terminology, the pockets are diverticula. The condition of having the pockets is diverticulosis. When you don't have enough fiber and you end up in the hospital for five days on IV antibiotics, that is diverticulitis. Okay, so diverticula are the pockets. Diverticulosis is the condition of having the pockets. And diverticulitis is when those pockets become inflamed. There's, you know, I've heard the whole spectrum of what causes it now. Some physicians believe nuts and seeds aggravate it, some don't, you know. But what the underlying belief is for everybody is to take fiber, to make sure that you are having frequent, soft um, bowel movements and keeping the colon cleared out. I, I know this is what happened to me. I know I was dehydrated. I went away for a girls weekend. I had a couple glasses of wine and we had almonds. And I think the combination of being dehydrated you know, and I think the almond, the almond got stuck, you know, and it infected that, and I didn't have enough fluid and fiber to keep things clear, and it became infected, okay? So usually sigmoid colon, it can also be left descending. So um, although somebody just told me her husband possibly got diagnosed with it on the right side, but predominantly it'll be a left-sided, okay? The inner mucosal layer, if you can imagine, you know, that tube once again, it likes to push up where blood vessels pass through, okay? Because that tends to be a weaker area. But do you remember where I showed you in the colon it has the three strips of muscles? This is why it happens in the colon. Between those three strips of muscle, the walls are weaker. So you get an area in the wall between those strips of muscle where a blood vessel passes through. There's not enough fiber. A patient has straining at the stool, okay? And they can have pressure build up on the wall and it causes an outpocketing, okay? Pretty, pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> fiber cannot be used in flare-ups, just so you all know. I'm sure it probably all sounds familiar. Um, fecal lift, once again, poop plug. Here we go. Left lower quadrant pain, fever. Okay, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Diarrhea or constipation. Um, also distension, right? Abdominal distension. Of course, bleeding is going to be a bad, bad sign if they have blood in the stool. That's, they kept us asking me, are you sure there's no blood in the stool? Because what does that mean? There could be rupture, right? And if there's rupture, there's probably an opening into the peritoneal cavity. So, okay. 
So fibros fibrosis of the colon, once again, when we have inflammation, we could have a deposition of that fibrous tissue and it could cause stenosis of the colon. There's also genetic link there. That could be your genetic lecture. There's genetic link with this. I have it, my parents have it, my grandmother has it, my great aunt had it. But also I think up to like 80% of the population has it. It's just whether it becomes symptomatic or not. I'm telling you right now, take your fiber. <laughs> you don't wanna, you do not want diverticulitis. Okay, inflammatory bowel disease. So the two main groupings of this is gonna be uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And there's kind of, I pulled in, um, I put in a couple of things off a, a website, um, you know, because I was looking at the book and it was like, hard, it's, it's hard to differentiate between them. Okay, they're both inflammatory bowel disorders and they both have different effects on the colon and they both affect different areas. Okay, so they both cause inflammation, but how they respond and how they present are gonna be different. Um, familiar predisposition, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, fever, okay. Um, so Crohn's disease. So you're gonna get granulomas formation, uh, granulomatous formation, um, mucosal swelling, erosion of the mucosa, um, sometimes um, of the colon and the terminal ileum, ileum, excuse me. Okay, leading to these like linear erosions. Um, it, it tends to affect more like patchy areas too, as opposed to the ulcerative colitis, okay? And that's called regional enteritis. Um, may cause weight loss. <clears throat> I had a friend in college who had this, had a lot of, lot of problems, a lot of weight loss, a lot of trouble um, controlling it. And then ulcerative colitis is gonna be a little bit more severe, it's gonna affect larger areas of the colon. Yes, I do think, somebody's asking if it's rheumatologic. Yep, I don't know if I have that in the notes or not. But yeah, because there's an autoimmune component. So yeah. Um, there's a question asking if it was rheumatologic, if there's a connection, and I do believe that there is. You know, that whole autoimmune, you get a lot of crossover when you get into autoimmune diseases like that. So, um, the thing about ulcerative colitis is you start to lose that epithelium, which is nasty stuff, right? You lose that epithelium. That epithelium is going to be that simple columnar. If you lose that epithelium, a couple things are going to happen. You can't discriminate what's going to come through. You're going to expose that underlying basement, which will cause more destruction and inflammation as it attacks that underlying connective tissue. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then it can lead to necrosis. And this is when people with ulcerative colitis have to have what? Have to have the resections, okay? So can cause uh, all this stuff. I'm kind of zipping through this. I mean, is this all ringing bells for you guys, right? This is all pretty straightforward stuff, okay? So um, just a couple of things that I got through uh, Hopkins' website. You know, you got Crohn's, you got ulcerative, but there can also be a crossover. And that's what I was sort of thinking as I was preparing things. It sounds so familiar. I think that they're kind of on a spectrum, you know, and they're to one side or the other of that spectrum, of that inflammation, of that bell, okay? The location, um, you know, the location of Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. It's kind of interesting. And I wonder what the physiology is behind that, why they affect should have thought, thought about that earlier. But anyway, <clears throat> and then the luminal appearance of them. Um, you know, normal is on the left there. You could see in both the Crohn's and the ulcerative colitis. Can you see, when, when we look at the, at the um, lumen of a normal intestine, that deep purple on the far left, do you see that deep purple that's like a thin rim around those wavy patterns, okay? That's gonna be the epithelium. But those projections are villi, okay? And villi are gonna be finger-like projections that if I were to take a small piece of colon out and open it up, it looks like a carpet, okay? And if you took a dissecting microscope, you could see the little um, villi on there, okay? So those are going to be the projections. Well, you can see the villi are going to be flattened, and the epithelium will also be destroyed in both of those cases. When you look at the picture to the middle and to the right, 
You know, so we're looking at a histological segment. We're looking through a microscope at those pictures. You can see that nice wavy appearance is destroyed in both of them. So a couple of things will happen with that. They won't have the protection, but they also won't have the absorption of substances at that area. In Crohn's disease, you get a thickened wall. I, I imagine that probably could happen in ulcerative colitis as well. But anyway, they're trying to give you uh, dip differences. And then what's called cobblestoning. If you look at the inside, <clears throat> excuse me, of somebody with Crohn's disease, it looks like a cobblestone appearance. It gets bumps. You know, you're going to get sort of fibrous um, destruction in these areas. It's going to make it bumpy instead of nice and smooth. Ulcer. Yes. I think it's the other way around. Ulcerative colitis has bloody stool. But I, I want to I, I say maybe Crohn's can too. Oh, I think it's ulcerative colitis. I'll double check that. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you get ulcerations with the ulcerative colitis. No, it's with ulcerative colitis because of the ulcerations. Yeah. You get the blood coming through. Yeah, exactly. And then um, you could get polyps in there as well. Excuse me. All right, good. So, <coughs> what itis condition is this? Where would we be out of what we've talked about? Well, this could actually look like something else kind of as well. Gonna be a little tough, I think. Yeah, this is gonna be esophagitis. Not quite as, you know, worn away as we're gonna see in ulcerative colitis and that Crohn's. But we also don't, you know, going back to the anatomy, <clears throat> in the intestines, we're gonna have more wavy like structures to the wall. Okay, so this is esophagitis. Good. What's this? Besides icky, where are we going to be? Which will connotate what it is. More, or, yeah, this is going to be a peritonitis. What's this? What's on the left and what's on the right? And this is all those itises that we just talked about. Oh, no, it's a good guess. Oh, no, that's a good guess, too. <laughs> and do you notice I started covering up? The complete website is underneath the pictures. I've started covering them up. That's not fair for us. I know. <laughs> but I want you guys to think a little bit. You guys are first, You did. You did. I tried to warm you up a little bit with the easier ones. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so you got a hole. So there we go. So it's not appendicitis because there's more than one hole, OK? in the lumen. We're looking in a lumen. There's multiple holes on the wall of whatever GI structure this may be. <clears throat> it's smooth. Well, yeah, I wouldn't think of, of that. I know that I told you it's more wavy. I think because they have one segment, it's not as obvious. Nope. Got me. Yep. What causes outpocketings? What condition? Really? That's, the That's diverticula. Those are diverticula. Isn't that crazy? And then on the right side, we've got diverticulitis. So you can see you've got an exudate in one of the openings. You've got like an inflammatory kind of serousy. You know, the body's going to respond by releasing some fluid. There's <clears throat> you can get, I think this is a familial condition where you get multiple diverticula. I think like I have three, three or four. And I think I know exactly when they happen too. <laughs> That's a different childbirth. <clears throat> One for each kid. That's right. One for each kid and an extra. <clears throat> okay. So diverticulosis would be on the left. Diverticulitis would be on the right. Yeah. I know. 
This is exceptional though, right? Usually people just have a couple. Usually people just have a couple. This is pretty obvious. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this is gonna be ulcerations, right? Some sort of peptic ulceration that's gonna be in the stomach. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's gastritis, okay? What a fine little organ this is. What itis is this? Yeah, this is, a, this is exactly what it looks like. It looks like a little pinky finger, the appendix, hanging off. Obviously, this has been taken out, hanging off the uh, cecum, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's a, like, um, well, it's like a longitudinal cut through it. So the full length of it, you know, is going from left to right. And they've cut it in half. And you could see that there's some inflammation, but also some necrosis. You know, that black substance is going to be the beginning of necrosis. Beginning, it's necrosis, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, ulcerations. So, you know, especially in the stomach, the stomach is high, high acidity. So we need protective mechanisms that are inside of the stomach and also inside the duodenum. That's going to be important too, right? Because you're spitting that really acidic, you know, I think it's two on the pH scale in the stomach. Is that right? I'm always awful at remembering numbers. Lab values, I can't remember to save my life. But anyway, so the acidity of the stomach, you know, the body is, I think it's two because the body is 735 to 745. I'll look it up on the break. I keep looking stuff up on the break. Anyway, so ulceration, we have to have protective mechanisms, okay? One of the first things is a mucus blanket. So if we were to look at the um, surface of the stomach, we'll have a mucus layer that helps to protect it. Now, the pancreas, guys, is going to link. Let me show you a quick little picture before. Um, oh, well, hold on. Oh, it's on, I think it's on the next lecture. <clears throat> Give me a second. Okay, let's look at this picture. People at home. Okay, good. So you can see there's a stomach coming off the stomach is the duodenum. Okay. Nestled right into that curve is the pancreas. And the pancreas has a little duct. We're going to go through the, all of this. So I just want to explain it before I move on to the next thing. That's going to secrete white to the duodenum. Okay? It's going to secrete enzymes which will break down carbs, lipids, and proteins. But the other major, 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 major substance that's so important that the pancreas secretes is bicarbonate. It's going to secrete bicarbonate into the duodenum. And what will happen when we ingest food is hormones are released that tell the pancreas, hey, we're eating now, and the stomach starts to release its um, acid to break substances down. And that acidic chyme, remember that word, C-H-Y-M-E, will be secreted into the duodenum, and then the pancreas will secrete a little bit of bicarb. And then a little bit more food comes out, a little bit of bicarb comes out, and it cools down that acidity, okay? It neutralizes that acidity. If it didn't, the duodenum would just be eaten apart, okay? because it doesn't have the other protective mechanisms that the stomach has. So do we get that anatomy? I'm going to go over it again. Do you kind of get the general gist of it, though? Okay? Okay. <clears throat> um, I forgot where I was. Here? Here. The other thing in the stomach, if you can imagine those columnar cells and they're right next to each other, they have what are called tight junctions between them. And those tight junctions are just connections between the cells that are impermeable. They will not let substances between those cells, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so we're talking about in the stomach. This is in the stomach. And in the small intestines, it's a little, it's a little more permeable in the intestines. But yes, yeah, so you could say that's in the intestines as well. The stomach also has high limit, high, high amount of mitosis. So if cells get destroyed, it's able to replenish those epithelial cells pretty quickly. It also stores pepsin as pepsinogen, and we talked about that before. So when our body senses and our stomach senses that we've ingested proteins, it'll secrete pepsinogen. It'll also secrete and release hydrochloric acid, which are both normally stored in cells. 
and when they get released, they mix together. The hydrochloric acid will cleave off um, part of that pepsinogen and turn it into pepsin. So these are all protective mechanisms so we don't eat away it at our stomach. Okay? Does that make sense? Because it's breaks in these protective mechanisms that will cause ulcerations. Okay? Yes? Good? All right. So peptic ulcer. I, I got to shut that door. I know that buzzing's bothering me. I'll be right back. I think, you know, a lot of this is pretty pretty straightforward, right? So peptic ulcers, you know, esophagus, uh, stomach duodenum, primarily on, in the stomach and duodenum. Okay, H. pylori, gastric hypersecretion, and that could happen from a couple mechanisms, right? People who are nervous can secrete more acidity. Um, smokers, one of the things in the book that I never put together, smokers secrete more um, acid for some reason um, that facilitate. Well, it's got to be part with the receptors. They uh, stimulate those nicotinic receptors. Remember that? Yeah, no. Okay, never mind. So anyway, <laughs> medications. Medications, what medications do is they'll decrease NSAIDs and aspirin, decrease the release of mucus from the gastric tract, and that's where we get problems with NSAIDs causing um, damage to the GI tract, okay? It's that whole COX-1 and COX-2 pathways, right? It inhibits both of them. <coughs> so it's great. It inhibits the inflammation, but it'll also inhibit the release of mucus from those gastric surfaces. And that's where we keep the ulcerations from the NSAIDs and aspirin. Okay. Um, patients can have hyperplasia of that acid-producing parietal cells and pepsin-secreting cells. Okay. Um, excessive gastric wall motility, cigarette smoking, stress, we went through all this, genetics, alcohol in, small, in high amounts can irritate gastric epithelium, okay? Um, perforation, um, H2 receptor antagonists can inhibit the release of gastric acid, okay, medications. So, um, portion of the stomach can be removed or the vagus nerve uh, may be cut, okay? To decrease the release of that acid or the acid. Okay, so type of peptic ulcers, I just put a little picture, I thought that was kind of cool, gastric versus duodenal, and duodenal sort of likes to go right where that curve is, okay, likes to go, substances come out from the pylorus, remember the pylorus is going to be that last part of the stomach, do you guys remember that, and what sphincter is right there between the pylorus and the duodenum? It's going to be, let's just do a quick, let me see what's next here. Okay, let's just do a quick little picture. I'm just going to do quick, quick, quick. Okay, because that is important to know. So esophagus, diaphragm, stomach, okay. Stomach is going to, so we've got the four different parts of the stomach. The last part is going to be the pylorus. Okay, the pyloric region of the stomach ends at the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is what's going to regulate the chyme or the um, contents of the stomach coming out into the duodenum. Okay, so pyloric sphincter is going to be between the stomach and the duodenum. That's going to be important to know in a couple of slides, okay? So where these gastric ulcers sort of like to be, and I mean they can't be anywhere, but it's boom, okay? Right at that little juncture as substances come out of the stomach. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, we can go back in. Back, good. <clears throat> so, uh, GI bleeding, brief review, vomiting, indicate um, from the stomach or some uh, GI bleeding. Oh, it, you know, well, blood in the in the vomit, of course. I know you guys know this, but I don't know. I like to be complete. So, dark stools will mean blood's coming from where. 
dark stools mean blood's going to come from higher up in the GI tract, right? Red blood is going to be lower in the GI tract, you know, like diverticulitis, obviously, if we have a rupture, hemorrhoids as well, God forbid, some sort of colon cancer. Okay, and the occult stool analysis. I know we know this, but like I said, I just like being complete. Um, obstruction, so different types of uh, obstructions that can happen. Obviously, a tumor would be obvious. Um, congenital malformation, ingested object, that's all, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Of course, adhesions, we like to make adhesions, especially, you know, post-surgical, we like to make them. Even if they go, I know somebody who just went in and got adhesions taken out of their stomach, well, guess what? That's her second time doing it. We like to make adhesions in the stomach. If it gets irritated, there's going to be inflammation. We're going to have a depositing of fibrous connective tissue. It happens in there. It likes to do it. Now, this is why I wanted to go over the pyloric sphincter. Okay, congenital pyloric stenosis. I had a friend whose son, a newborn son, had this. And guess what they thought it was for a month or two? They just thought it was reflux. And they had him on, um, why can't I think of the medication? It begins with an M. Uh, it's for the acidity. Um, they had um, M. It was like, it's Pepsid, they could use it for kids. No, 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 that's an anti-emetic, right? Oh, it's not. oh yeah, no, that's, that's, it's not Prilosec. I don't know, it's, it, once again, I'm not good with medications, but it's in there. So anyway, months and months and months until finally he took his son out to Syracuse and, you know, I imagine they'd have to scope a child. I don't know how they found out, but they found out that he had this pyloric stenosis and he was start. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, help things get mess, and they had to go in and do the surgery to open it. And so what they'll do, you know, they go in, <clears throat> and this is just not big enough. Okay, that pyloric sphincter is not big enough; it doesn't open up enough. So food comes down, it gets trapped, and it comes back up. Okay, so that should be something that should always be checked with an infant with, uh, you know, persistent vomiting. So congenital pyloric stenosis. That's probably, I think, where my friend went. Because he was, yeah. No offense to anybody here, none, 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 but you know, it could just be. It usually takes a while for them to, they usually think it's reflux and they try treating it for reflux first before they yeah. actually do a test and find out that it's. And what do they do for the test? Somebody's saying that they deal with it quite a bit. Do they scope them or do they do some sort of imaging? Um, What imaging cat? Scan or fluoroscopy? I couldn't do fluoroscopy. Oh. Who knows? Anybody know? Shoot me an email. What the I'll test is. Right. I, I want to say scope. Anybody listening, shoot me an email. Let us know how they I test for congenital pyloric stenosis. <clears throat> Yes, yes, yes. And it wasn't until they showed up to the ER with a severely dehydrated oh. and emaciated baby sure. that the pediatrician finally listened and sure. it wasn't spit up. It right. was projectile vomiting. Exactly. And that's a good point is the projectile vomiting is, you know, another good sign of that rather than just a little spit up. They try changing formulas and they think they're allergic and yeah, so I know that is a Which tough one. It is a tough one. Is what it is. Sure, exactly, exactly. It's exactly. tough, man. I would not want to work with infants. It's tough. I just can't tell you. I hate it when kids are sick. So anyway, so moving on, small intestines in the inguinal canal, okay, and that's what can happen too. We can get them down and of course that's going to be a problem if it progresses because you can get what? The next thing, strangulation of those intestines. That for, always freaks my A&P students out when I tell them that's what intestines coming out of a hernia. <laughs> so, uh, okay, interception, interception is going to be a telescoping. Okay, um, a dynamic ileus is going to be paralytic due to some sort of nervous complication. Um, you know, we're going to go over the nerves. I thought I had that earlier. I had the. Oh, no, I'm thinking of the blood supply. Okay, so some sort of nerve problem, which is going to decrease the nervous supply to that.
Okay, sequelae of obstruction, um, vomiting, abdominal distension. I'm kind of just buzzing through this because I feel like you guys know most of this stuff, right? Okay. Um, malabsorption. So, you know, malabsorption can happen from a couple different things. Um, so I put, you know, two of the big ones here. I, I had a patient who had um, a chronic pancreatitis and he had malabsorption. Can anybody tell me why? Chronic pancreatitis and he had a form of malabsorption that's not on here. It just popped in my brain, so I thought it'd be a good thing to talk about. The pancreas releases. The pancreas releases digestive enzymes. It's not going to function as efficiently. If it's inflamed, those areas are not going to be functioning proficiently. But in addition, that inflammation will block the duct system and won't let those enzymes come out. Okay, so that would be a form of malabsorption. Of course, we know if we um, have you know pernicious anemia, so we're going to be la lacking what with pernic pernicious anemia? B12, right? We don't have um, um, why am I I'm blanking out on the substance in the in the stomach <clears throat> that helps with the absorption of B12. You can lack it, you can not eat it but you can also have a lack of intrinsic factor, okay? Now, intrinsic factor is gonna be released from the stomach. Intrinsic factor helps with the absorption of that. The thing about B12, too, guys, is it's broken down by the acidity of the stomach and it can't be absorbed properly. So those patients have to do what? Either take it sublingually, which is not as effective as I am, right? I am, right? Injections, yeah, okay? So defective absorption, oh, and the resection of the ileum. So people, if they have um, Crohn's disease and they have to have part of the ileum resected, the ileum, guys, is where bile salts are recirculated. I'm gonna go through this. Bile salts are absorbed in the ileum and sent back to the liver into that hepatic storage and then re-secreted to the duodenum, used to emulsify and absorb fats, back to the ileum, reabsorbed, back to the liver, okay? And 80% of your bile salts keep with this, what's called enterohepatic um, circulation. So if somebody has most of their ileum resected, they're gonna have difficulty absorbing fats. Now the step further with that is fat is important. Fat, you know what, I'm gonna do metabolism with you guys. I'm gonna do like an hour of metabolism. I think it's important. We'll go over like carbs, lipids, proteins, why they're important, how they're absorbed, all that kind of stuff, okay? That's what I'm gonna do for one of the last classes. The reason that fats are important is a couple reasons. They form the basis of steroid hormones, okay, which are gonna be your adrenal cortical hormones and also, I'm gonna go through all this, okay? Your adrenal cortical hormones and also, you know, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. They support organs. They create a fat pad behind the eye. They help to hold the um, kidneys up. They provide warmth. They provide part of cell membranes, okay? They're very important, okay? If you don't have the bile salts to emulsify and absorb fats, you're not gonna absorb fats. You won't absorb the substances you need, excuse me, you need to make those structures, but you also won't be able to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. So that brings up a whole plethora. A, D, E, and K are not gonna be absorbed. Eyesight, bone health, you know, antioxidants, clotting. Well, you can make K, but that's, you know, okay. So um, how did I get off on that? What was I talking about? Okay, oh, resection of the ileum, okay? So that's a complication. Defective absorption, we're talking about gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. So this, what happens is, you can imagine, you know, we're looking at the inside of the GI tract again. And we have those little carpet-like villi, you know? So if I were to open up that tube and lay it flat, you could see this kind of carpety-like presentation. Those little projections are villi. People who have celiac disease or that gluten sensitivity, that gluten destroys the villi. And once again, that wavy presentation that we'll find in the GI tract is what's so important for absorption. It's going to increase, gives us tons of surface area. They don't have that surface area. They don't absorb nutrients like they need to. Okay.
So back if they, avoid gluten. they do. It grows back if they avoid gluten. So the main treatment is to pull them off of gluten, which I can't imagine. That's got to be so difficult. And, um, you know, because gluten is the protein in wheat products. I mean, it's everywhere, right? So, um, so yeah, no, it grows back and they can live a very healthy life. But once again, it's, um, it's the diagnosis of it. You know, it's the diagnosis of it. People think that, um, I don't know, that they're just having diarrhea or this or the other thing. But anyway, um, so lactose intolerant, we talked about that. Um, obvious malnutrition will happen with people who have these problems. Diarrhea, satyria, um, excessive fat in the stool. We'll see this, you know, with resection of the ileum or difficulty absorbing fats. And, of course, the pathognomonic sign for that is very... Um, Stinky, floating <laughs> stools. Fabulous. Okay, so GI tumors, um, you know, polyps, we're all familiar with this, and polyps, of course, can be benign. This is why it's so, so important to have colonoscopies done. I still can't believe, I just got my mom to get a colonoscopy, go me. She's 60, what are we in? She's almost 63, and she had never had one yet. So she did, she had two little polyps and she's good to go. But it's important to get those polyps early because polyps are more prone to be turning, to turn cancerous, okay? So familial polyposis coli, FPC. Um, is it gonna be a genetic defect that pr uh, predisposes people to multiple polyps? And of course, if they have multiple polyps, they're gonna be more prone to cancer. So, um, so about all those, I should have broken this down a little bit more. But all those conditions that we just spoke about, okay? So if you want to take a minute and look at this, which condition is this? Oh, darn it, I didn't move that. Don't look at the web link. What condition is this? From what I've given you, the microscopic descriptions I've given you. And normal is on the left and it's progressively getting worse to the right. This is a representative of celiac. Those finger-like projections on the left are the villi. And you could see, this is really actually a great picture, I didn't even think about this. You could see those simple columnar cells. They look exactly like you would think. They look like columns, and they're one cell layer thick. And they're lining, they create a nice little barrier, don't they, okay? The dark, Dots. That's what I was going to talk to you about, this inflammation. That's an inflammatory response. Because obviously, <clears throat> they're going to have some more exposure um, if, if the epithelium is going to break down, and there'll be an inflammatory response in that way, in that, um, in that response. Okay. So this will be celiac disease. Very good. <coughs> Out of what we just talked about, I know. You should have seen some of the pictures that I didn't put in. Oh, what is this? Okay, this is gonna be in the bell, and there's multiple what? In it. Small tumors, and very, very small tumors are called Polyps. This is going to be that familial condition where they get multiple polyps that will be on the surface. Right? Those are not in the lumen. It's open. They've taken they the, the, they've opened it. They had to resect that part of the bell, or this is from a cadaver. I don't know which. Okay. This look, not to be gross, but this looks fresh. So I'm imagining this was resected from somebody. Okay and take it out, and it's laid, that tube-like structure is laid open. Are you with me? And you could see all the polyps in there, okay? This condition will be, yeah, this is gonna be pyloric stenosis, and that's a great picture of the connection between the stomach and the duodenum. And can you see underneath it, um, in that circle, but also beneath that, that glandular tissue. Glandular tissue is lumpy bumpy. If we look at a gland that has glandular tissue, it's lumpy bumpy. And that lumpy bumpy tissue would be what gland? 
that's nestled right into the duodenum. That's going to be the pancreas. It's that close. It's right there. Okay. Good. Bread and butter. Easy peasy. Right? It's going to be inguinal hernia, right? <clears throat> you can see pre and post mash. Pre yeah, pre and post. Sorry. Okay. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the spermatic cord, right? That'll carry blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, okay? Vas deferens. What condition is this? This is such a weird picture, but I thought it was a good picture. What condition is this? <coughs> kind of a tough one. Can you visualize that's the tube? That whole structure going through the middle of the screen from bottom to top is a tube. Yes, that's the interception or the telescoping. Okay? That's that interception or the telescoping. Good. All right. So we got through most of that. Let's do a quick little break and I'll start the next. What time is it? I think we should just round it up early today. What do you think? I haven't let you guys out early ever. So Merry Christmas. We'll start the next one next time we meet. Okay, so it'll be the second part of gastrointestinal, which will be um, hepatobiliary. Okay, so we'll go through the anatomy of that. We'll go through some disease processes. A lot of it'll be bread and butter for you. Okay, and um, I'll have this lecture uploaded by tonight at some point. I'll have a quiz for you in the next day or so. Sound good? No class next week. Okay, this is not true for everybody who's listening to the tapes in the future, but just for this particular first taping, we have no class next Wednesday. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And I will see you guys. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you have two papers? Yeah. Oh, good. Then this will be a nice break for you guys. <laughs>